Hello there and welcome back to another video here on Wristwatch Revival. My name is Marshall. Thank you so much for coming along. This time on the bench we have what is I believe the smallest watch I've ever seen. <laughs> Look at this thing. That is a mechanical movement in there that is, uh, well it's currently not running, in this little tiny watch. This is a Washington branded watch. I don't know um, anything about that brand. This is a women's watch, probably dates to the to the late 50s, early 60s, somewhere in that realm. As you can see, I can get the hands to turn with the crown, but I can't get it to wind and I can't get it to run. And this watch was handed me from a, a close friend of mine. And uh, yeah, she said, hey, see what you can do. And that's what we're going to do today on the channel. We're going to see not only just what it's like to look inside of a movement that is so small, but yet has all the features of a mechanical movement, but also we're gonna to try to get the thing running and get this watch back in good shape. You can see that these are actually the original lugs for the watch. They're the really old school kind. We'll be replacing those as well. Sorry, not lugs, spring bars. And now we can uh, open up the back of the watch and let's get a look at this movement. I gotta see what's in this. <laughs> look at that. It has all the parts of like a normal Swiss movement. They're just kind of crammed on top of each other in this little tiny case. That is hilarious. Oh, the movement actually looks pretty good. <laughs> what a wild little watch. These, uh, this size of watch has gone completely out of fashion. Huh? Movement is out. Oof, there's a lot of dirt in there. This has probably been sitting for a while. Let's see if the crystal wants to come out. Yeah, it does. And it's in rough shape as well. This watch could definitely do with a new crystal. We'll get the hands off. And then uh, we're going to do what we always do on this channel. We're going to try to bring this thing back to life and get it back onto somebody's wrist so that they can enjoy it. And the, the process for doing that with a watch like this, it varies. It, it depends a lot on uh, numerous factors that we'll go through over the course of this restoration. But, you know, the basics are that we take the movement inside, that's the engine of the watch, if you will, and we completely disassemble every single part, every screw, spring, gear, everything, then clean it in a professional watch cleaning machine. The one I have is actually from like the 1940s, but still it is a professional watch cleaning machine. And then we reassemble and properly lubricate it to get it back into running order. Now, we are gonna to need to do some troubleshooting here because this watch isn't running and I'm not sure why. So it could just be that it needs a service. It could be an issue with the spring. It could just be that it's old and gunked up. Oof, that dial's gonna need some help too. But overall, the movement actually looks like it's in fine shape. This is a, a mass produced movement from the era. The uh, most prolific movement manufacturer is currently called ETA. And that's what this is as well. This was a, this is an ETA movement. This is an 1170 is the number of this movement. Movements are also called a caliber. If you've ever heard that term, take off the cannon pinion. And that'll allow us to uh, flip the watch over and start to disassemble it. <laughs> hmm. Awkward. So my movement holder is kind of too big for this movement. And I'm going to see what if I just cinch it down all the way? Will it actually grab on or do I need to figure out some other solution here? Let's find out. Is it going to grab? Yeah. Oh, barely. Wow. Really barely, but it worked. We've got a, we, we've got a movement holder, although <laughs> This thing is so small that I have to use my hand to stabilize it. This movement holder is actually supposed to provide a stable base, but I had to get it crunched in so far that it's not really doing it. So I have to be extra careful here. What a bizarre thing. We'll start by taking off the balance, just like we do on any other movement. This will protect the balance staff, which is like the axle for that. It's very thin and also the balance spring, just for many types of uh, accidental damage. You can see everything's kind of stacked on top of each other here, and you know, that's for obvious reasons. There's not enough room if you do it any other way. Looks 
looks like we're gonna have to take off the train wheel bridge first, and then I assume we can just take off the train wheels from there. You can see this exposes them. So that didn't, okay, there. All right, yeah, so these wheels will come out, but as you can see, there's kind of another bridge underneath that's covering up the next set of wheels. So we'll have to take that out. It's just, it reminds me of like a, I don't know, like an apartment building, right? Like if, if you wanna get a lot of people in one space, you can either go wide or you can go tall. And they went tall. <laughs> because they just didn't have room to put all the components. But as you can see, all the components are there. It, this is not any different than a regular Swiss movement that we'd work on on the channel. It's just all the parts are much, much smaller and they are kind of piled up on top of each other to be able to fit. It's, it's always incredible because, you know, when I work on a regular size movement, the parts feel small and you kind of marvel at how they made these back in the day. But this one's next level. <laughs> this one is like, how in the heck did they come up with this? All right, well, in order to keep taking uh, the movement apart, it looks like we need to take off the crown wheel and the ratchet wheel because they're kind of in the way of the next train of wheels. So this will come out and that should free up that center wheel in the middle now. Yeah, there we go. So that comes right out. And there's the click and it has a spring underneath it. So we'll take it off now. The click is actually what makes the winding sound when you wind up your watch. A lot of people think it's the gears touching up against each other, the wheels, but it's not. It's actually just that little piece of metal on that little tiny circular spring that I just took out, rubbing up against the ratchet wheel. Now that those are out of the way, we can finish disassembly of the top here by taking off the barrel bridge. And we'll need to take a look at the mainspring and the mainspring barrel there because since this watch is a non-runner, that could be uh, the reason why. If the mainspring is broken, for example, the, uh, the watch won't be able to have any power in it and it won't run. As I disassemble movements like this, I'm keeping an eye out just for things that look out of place or broken or worn. So far, nothing though. This movement looks fine. It looks like it needs a service. Like you can see that a lot of the wheels are kind of sticking in the hole and you know things just don't really want to come apart probably just because it hasn't been serviced in years. But overall, it's pretty clean. No crazy damage or anything, you know, no parts missing or snapped in half or anything like that. So that's promising. Now we can flip the watch over and take apart the keyless works and the motion works. Setting lever spring, minute wheel, minute wheel, come on. Oh, there we go. Minute wheel. Intermediate wheel. And now we can take off the yoke and the yoke spring carefully. Okay, so everything looks like it's uh, coming apart all right. Yoke comes out. And now we can put the uh, balance back in. We put this back in so that I can put this through the watch cleaning machine and get the balance, the spring, and the, everything cleaned up. And then the jewels that sit on the top and the bottom of this balance here, the beautiful red jewel that you see there, there's actually two on top, two on bottom. We'll take those apart separately after that's been through the cleaning machine and clean and re-lubricate those on their own. All right, now we can take apart, and let's take a look at this mainspring. Hmm. No, that looks fine. It's not obviously broken at any rate. But let's take out the uh, the arbor. Yeah, no, the spring looks fine, at least just at first. 
we need to take it out of the barrel. So we'll kind of gently walk it out with our thumbs. This is really the only way to get the spring out. And yeah, it looks fine actually, unless maybe the end's broken. No, no, that spring looks good. Okay, I just had to show you this by the way. So this is a pocket watch movement like the ones that I recommend working on when you're starting off. And that's the entire movement that we're working on. It's smaller than the ratchet wheel on this thing. I mean, look at the difference. It's just incredible. That's an entire watch that would fit into the ratchet wheel of a, of a larger pocket watch movement. And that's, by the way, why I recommend starting off on things like pocket watch movements, because they're pretty cheap, they're plentiful, and you know what? You can see everything, right? Where on something like this, boy, it, it gets really, really small. All right, let's get everything into the cleaning baskets and prepped up for the watch cleaning machine. That way, we can uh, do the next stage of the service for this watch by cleaning the parts all the way. Now, before we do that, let's take a look at the dial because that dial, it's a little hard to tell um, just having taken it apart, but it looks like it might have some potential here. Now, I'm usually very conservative about how I, what I do to a dial. I never refinish them. I never like paint on them or do anything like that. But this dial, it just looks really, really dirty to me. And so I'm going to try to clean it up. You see all that gunk around the outside. That does not look like corrosion to me. That looks like dirt. And if it's dirt, I can clean it off. So I'm just going to take some water, you know, nothing special as far as any uh, cleaning solutions or anything like that goes. This is just good old water. And I'm going to use these different, different shaped swabs to go around very carefully and see if we can't improve the look of this dial. Cause this thing was very, very dirty. Wow, look at that. That is coming out much, much better actually. Using a microfiber cloth to kind of dry up and make sure that there's nothing left on there. But take a look at that. That's what it looks like now. And that's what it looked like when I started with it. Look at that. Boy, this thing cleaned up beautifully. I'll put it back in my dial holder and we'll uh, and we'll set it aside. Now we can get to the watch cleaning here. This is the watch cleaning machine that I mentioned before. It actually has a four stage process. The first one is cleaning, the second two are a rinse, and then the third is a drying. And this is the cleaning process here as we uh, put it in. And then this particular model is called a Mastermatic, and it has an extra feature that it spins it back and forth, as you see here. So that's pretty cool. While the watch is cleaning, by the way, I wanted to mention that I do have a Patreon for this channel. It's patreon.com slash wristwatch revival. And if you're interested in it, you do get one of these and one of these. You get a thank you card and a sticker in the mail for whatever level of patron that you sign up for. And uh, it supports the channel and I really appreciate it. And I wanna say uh, thank you to everybody over on the Patreon who supports me. It means the world to me. Thank you so much. And take a look at the parts all laid out and beautiful. Now that they're out of the cleaning machine, they're all set to go and ready for reassembly. And that's it. Those are all the parts that make up this watch. And I'll tell you, it doesn't take up much space on my bench. <laughs> so first things first, um, let's get the barrel, spring, arbor, and lid all reassembled again. That's going to be the power source for the watch. Basically anything on a watch that moves, tells time, tells the date, does the moon phase, anything like that is going to be powered off of one spring. And all the watch does, it's kind of weird, is it controls how fast that spring unwinds. That's what a watch does. That's how it works. And that spring is the mainspring. And in order to get it safely back into the barrel, we use a tool here called a mainspring winder. Before we do that, I'm going to put just a thin layer of oil, uh, kind of a grease on the mainspring. That is going to lubricate it to make sure that it uh, performs optimally and that there's no corrosion or anything like that. So the mainspring winder here is a tool, it's a specialty tool that allows you to wind the mainspring back into the tool in a similar way to how you would put it back into the housing itself and then use the tool to push the mainspring safely into the housing without having to bend it or shove it in or do anything that might cause it damage. 
just like that. So now I can take the winder off the front and then the mainspring should sit inside of the tool in the same way, well, in the opposite direction, but in the same way that it will sit in the barrel itself. So let's take a look. There we go. Now we're all set. So I can do the good stuff now. Oh, that's sweet. I love that sound and I love that feeling. Now the mainspring is safely put back into its home, the mainspring barrel, and I can put my mainspring winders away and continue with the reassembly. So first we're gonna put the barrel arbor back into place and then we can put the lid on. I'm also gonna grab just a little bit of medium viscosity oil here for the top where the lid meets the arbor. Okay, and then I've got this little press down tool that evenly applies pressure to the top of the lid to snap it into place. You can use tweezers for this too. I just found this to be a little bit easier. Done, that's it. All right, so now we can set that aside and begin the reassembly of the watch itself. You know, it's really interesting. I still haven't actually found anything that would make me think that the watch shouldn't run. So kind of back on the theory that it just needed a service and that maybe some of the oil had dried up. When oil inside of a watch dries up fully, it's interesting. It actually makes a transition from being a lubricant to being actually like an abrasive and it can stop the watch in its tracks if the watch hasn't ran in a long time or been serviced in a long time. So maybe that's what's going on here. We'll have to find out. For now, we can put on the barrel bridge and the barrel. And while we're doing that, I might as well get the click and the click spring in place. That click spring is probably the smallest, lightest piece on the whole thing. Okay, click goes into place as well. And now we can grab the screw to kind of hold it all together. There we go. And now we'll start to reassemble the train of wheels as well. We've already got the escape wheel in, but now we can put the center wheel. I think it goes in like that. Yeah, see, this is just a little weird because every part is kind of sandwiched on top of another because of the size of the movement. But it looks like it works. This, this uh, ordering of the assembly I'm gonna tighten down the ratchet wheel now. And then there's this kind of intermediate bridge that goes over the center wheel. Just, you can see the clearances are very, very tight. The escape wheel there is kind of up against it. Okay. Next wheel goes in, this one goes off to the side here. This is the wheel that runs the center seconds. It's kind of funny, this wheel doesn't actually do anything other than that. It just takes the power from the wheel below it and transfers it up to the top. And this is the wheel that actually holds the center seconds hand. That's on the dial side, of course, the hands but the side we're on is called the movement side. This is the business. Okay, so let's see if we can't get this train wheel bridge to sit nicely. I need to line up all three pivots with their jewels. Okay, yeah, that looks right. Yeah, okay. Well, maybe we got a little lucky here. That went on quite easily. Let's give it a quick spin. Yeah, great. Now I'm not that surprised about this. The These type of movements were really made to be worked on. Ooh, this is a, okay. 
So it's a little bit of a tight fit. I probably was supposed to have that on first, but there was plenty of clearance, so it wasn't a big deal. But those are the types of things that if, you know, if I had worked on a bunch of these, I would have put that on first and just remembered it. But as is often the case on this channel, this is the first time I'm working on this movement. <laughs> it's interesting because it's made my my learning journey, I think, accelerated because I'm always working on different types of stuff because I'd like to have a lot of variety for you. Um, but I think that most watchmakers tend to focus a little bit more on like one brand or maybe just a couple of brands so that you can kind of like build up parts and get used to them and stuff. And honestly, it's not uncommon for watchmakers to focus on this brand, which again is ETA, as ETA movements have been used in virtually every brand, especially if you go back in time a little bit. Okay. Now we can move the watch back over and start to assemble the keyless works on the other side. That's the sliding clutch. That actually slides along the winding stem, which is kind of interesting. You know, the one that's attached to the crown that you turn with your fingers actually goes right along that. Okay, and this is an intermediate wheel. And then the minute wheel. <laughs> These parts are, I know I've said it a bunch, but so small. Even by watch standards, <laughs> these are very, very small. Okay, speaking of that winding stem with winding crown on it, let's get some grease going on that. You want to make sure you have enough, but you don't want to overdo it with the grease. The crown will operate much more smoothly though, if it, if it has the proper lubrication on it. Okay. So that's back in place. Just make sure everything's set correctly. And now we can put the setting lever in. And make sure that it's engaged with the, uh, with the stem after having tightened it down. And now we can put the yoke in. So this is the, the last step, basically, second to last step here for the keyless works. Again, this side of the watch is what we call the dial side because dial sits right on top of everything you see here. Covers up basically all of it. Okay, so that is now in place. And now we can do the last thing here for the keyless works, and that is the setting lever spring. It's a bizarre looking spring. These are, they always look almost like cartoonish, <laughs> just because of how funny the dimensions and stuff are. This one looks like it's kind of like a person reaching down to the left. That happens sometimes too. And we'll screw it down most of the way, but not all the way. The spring needs to be engaged with the setting lever, right? There, 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 like that before you tighten it down all the way, just so you don't bend that spring sideways or even break it. So there we go. Now we can tighten it down all the way. When you tighten down screws on a watch, it's important not to over tighten and you develop a sense for it over time. I have had people ask me about a torque wrench for it, which is how you would do it on a car. And I've used those before on cars, but they actually do technically make them for watches, but that isn't generally the practice. You develop a feel for it. You know when it's when it's tight enough. Okay, so now we need some grease here. This goes on the friction point between the setting lever and the setting lever spring. And that just ensures that uh, A, that there's no wear via metal shavings or anything like that. And also that the whole thing operates more smoothly. Um, you know, a little bit of grease goes a long way there. And a lot of grease went a little too far. So I'm going to go ahead and use some Rodico to clean that up. Okay, with that installed, we can turn the movement over and we can see if this thing's gonna run. Again, I have not been given any indication here that this wouldn't run. So I'm just gonna continue with the assembly and see if we can get it to or not. Okay, so let's put the pallet fork and the pallet fork bridge in. 
very tight corners or quarters here. But I think I've got it seated properly. I still am struggling with where to put my hands. But there we go. And now it's a moment of truth. So what we need to do now is put the balance in and see if it'll run. And I'm really crossing my fingers here because I just didn't see anything wrong. And if this watch doesn't run, it means basically starting over again and troubleshooting from the ground up. I really don't wanna have to do that if possible, so please run. Please. Oh, oh, there is life and the watch is running. Oh, that's fantastic. That is like a weight off my chest because <laughs> I honestly don't know where I would have gone next if it wouldn't run because everything looked fine. And it turns out that our hunch from the get-go, well, our first hunch I think was mainspring, but our second hunch that it just needed to be serviced was right. This watch, the oils dried up. And when that happened, they gunked up the wheels. And you know, it probably didn't help that the wheels are very, very, very small. So let's take a look now though, as we have to continue with the rebuild and we're going to now oil the jewels. So jewels, if you've ever wondered what they are, they're a synthetic ruby. So they're a sapphire actually, um, because rubies are actually just sapphires that are red. And these are extremely hard. They're the second hardest you can get on the hardness scale right below diamonds. And that makes them really great bearings, right? When you put metal up against this, they never wear down and they require that much lubrication, like an absolutely tiny amount. So they're really perfect for watches. And, you know, as a kind of form follows function type thing too, they look sweet. I mean, that color is beautiful and it's not a color you really see that often, right? That particular kind of translucent red is not that, that uh, commonly seen and it's beautiful. I love it. Okay. In order to continue though with the restoration here, we now need to oil the cap jewels. So I've done that off camera here and now I can put them back into place. And what I've done is just simply cleaned them and then placed a drop of oil on the top so that uh, that pivot is constantly lubricated and that's exactly what we want. Now I can put the shock spring back into place and job is done. After I do the bottom, let's take a look at the time grapher and see how it's running. Hey, that is not too bad at all, actually. Now, 247 degrees of amplitude, fine. And it's running between two and seven seconds a day. Great. You know, this is not going to be a daily wear for anybody anyway, but I am very happy with that. And uh, now we can continue with the rest of the restoration. Now, the first place that I want to start are the hands. Now, I know that this seems like a very small detail. These hands are actually just super tiny, but take a look at the loom. It is worn out. It is terrible. It is black. It looks like dirt. And I think that especially now that we fully cleaned the dial, it wouldn't look right. So I'm going to reloom these hands. And to do that, it's funny because you'd think that those are like manufactured like that, but they're not. Uh, th this is a liquid that gets applied and then dried and we can do that ourselves. In order for us to take that step though, we do have to remove the old loom. So I'm just going to use a pair of tweezers here to kind of knock out the old loom from the old hands. It's also worth noting that you should wear a mask when you do this and make sure that you're in a ventilated space. These hands were, um, the loom is tritium, which is technically radioactive, but it's, it's basically inert at this point, so it's nothing dangerous. But some hands are or were um, lubri lubricated, illuminated with uh, radium. And radium is very, very dangerous substance that you have to be very, very careful with. And I just try to play it safe either way. So I'm just going to use some Rotico to pick it up and just, you know, that way I can dispose of that Rotico myself. Now, in order to re-loom, we need a little kit here that comes with two main things, a luminous powder and then a binding agent of some sort. And the binding is just that, uh, that clear liquid that you see in the other jar. So what we do is we take a little bit of luminous powder. That's just glow-in-the-dark powder. And then we take some of the binding agent here and we mix it in. And then what we do is we look for just the right mixture. And the right mixture in this case is it's still 
liquid enough to be able to have like capillary action where it'll spread out on its own, but it's also thick enough so that um, it's not too runny and it doesn't just run all over everywhere like water um, when you put it on. So you want right in the middle, like right about there. And I'm gonna go for my secret ingredient here. <laughs> yes, that is coffee. I keep a little jar of coffee in the refrigerator that's been condensed down a little bit and I'm just gonna add a tiny bit. Now, what does this do? This makes the loom a little bit more of a ground, like kind of a brown gray color rather than stark white. Because on an old movement like this, if you reloom the hands to just like a blaring white, it stands out and it bothers me. It doesn't look right on a really old watch. Now this one is gonna look really good, I think, so I put just a couple of droplets just to knock that harsh white edge off. But you can put more in if you think that it's gonna match the dial or the hands or the look of the watch better to make it a darker a gray-brown kind of color. But I felt for this one that it really just needed that, just that little over-the-top edge taken off, so I just put a tiny bit of coffee in there to, to act as basically a pigment. So now I can simply take the luminous compound and drag it over the hole on the back of the hand and I can let capillary action do the work for me. So that will suspend itself over that gap naturally. Now if I put too much in, it'll bleed through to the other side. And if I put not enough in, then it won't uh, have enough to spread out evenly across the whole surface. And look at that one shot at that one too. I'm getting good at this. Now I can put the lid on this thing. And while we let that dry, let's go ahead and take care of the case. Now this case is plated gold. And if you don't know what that mean, means, um, it's usually the word plated is used, sometimes gold filled, which is a slightly different process, but the same idea. It means that they take a base metal, in this case brass, which is cheap and easy to manufacture, and then they electroplate it with gold. And that puts a few microns of gold on it and gives you that cool gold look, but not the gold, the gold price. What it means for us is that we have to be careful with it. So let's take a look at the hands here before we get working back on the case again. And very nice. That is, that's kind of exactly what I was hoping for. The color again is white, but it's not, I know it's hard to say, it's just not that, that really bright stark white that sometimes you get with brand new loom. So we'll set these hands aside and we can uh, address the case now. So out of the ultrasonic cleaner, as you can see, the gold plating is very much intact, but bleh, not in great shape. Um, pretty scratched up and just seems to have some pretty extensive wear. Now, if you take something like this and you put it on a polishing wheel, you know, I have a Dremel that I use for the channel sometimes, you'll, you'll tear off that gold and leave the the brass underneath, and that is a horrible look. And then if you're gonna do that, then what you have to do is just replate the whole thing. In this case though, I'm gonna use a, a hand polishing compound. This is like a chemical polisher is what they call it. Like it's not really about the abrasion, it's about um, how it interacts with the, the dirt and the little scratches and stuff. This one's called Flitz, there's another one called Simichrome, and they both work very similarly. I prefer this one a little bit to the other. But all you do is take a microfiber cloth and just give it a good rub down, just a little massage on the old massage chair here for the case, and check out the results you can get just from going at it for about, I don't know, 20 minutes like that. Look at that. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? As long as the scratches are small, you can see it left a few, but look how much better that looks. That's under like a lot of magnification and also it hasn't been put in the ultrasonic again yet. I'll do that before the end of our video here, but it is really great results for not going overboard with the restoration. So we'll set that aside now that it's done and we can continue with the rebuild. We're in the home stretch now. The watch is running. We restored the dial, we restored the hands, and we restored the case. But again, the way I like to do it, which is um, a light touch is what I would call it, right? Like for example, this dial, all I did is take the dirt off. Now, if there was paint missing, well, then it would have been tough luck. But in this case, this dial came out absolutely beautiful because it just was really dirty. And the hands, yes, I re-loomed them, but again, I tried to kind of match them up to how I think that they should look for the watch here rather than just put stark white on there. When it comes to the case, I didn't want to leave it dinged up, but I also didn't want to go overboard and over polish it or have to replate the whole thing. So I used my, my chemical 
polisher. It's it's about finding that balance for each watch, each watch, and it's different each time. There is no like playbook for it. You just need to kind of build up the skills so that you can recognize. Okay, this is a time when I'm gonna, you know, fully strip down and replate this case, or I'm gonna polish it up to shiny, or this is a time when I'm not. Okay, so the hands are on, the dials on. One more thing that we need to replace though is that crystal. That crystal was in horrible shape. And yes, you can buff out and kind of get crystals looking pretty darn good again, but they only cost a few bucks and putting on a new crystal is doing the watch about the biggest favor you could do it. <laughs> so that's what we're gonna do here. Little tiny crystal. I've never even used these attachments on my rover press because I've never replaced a crystal this small. Okay, so now what we can do is bring the case up and watch. I'm trying to get it so that the outside of the crystal can dig in. There we go. And now I can undo and then the crystal will expand into the slot and it'll sit under its own friction inside the watch case just like that. And check it out. Looks beautiful, seated nicely, the right size and everything's ready to go. Now I'm gonna use this air blower just to make sure that there's no bits of debris or anything floating around in there and we can get right into the home stretch on this uh, restoration. Replace the crown and the stem. And put in the last little parts here. And now we can replace the case back. And this is exciting. I, <laughs> I'm actually kind of surprised at how great this watch came out because this isn't the type of thing I'd normally put a lot of time in, but look at it. <laughs> it's actually just sweet. It's a beautiful little watch, all told. And uh, I even found online one of these kind of old school stretchy bracelet bracelets, right? You know, these are like the flex ones. And it, God, it suits the watch kind of perfectly, to be honest. <laughs> And uh, I love the way this watch came out. In fact, you know what? I can't help myself. I got to try this thing on. Let's take a look at the, uh, <laughs> what do you think? Does it suit me? <laughs> Maybe not quite my style, but uh, yeah, I like it anyway. Who cares? It's a cool watch. And I, and I hope that the owner of this watch uh, we'll love it and maybe even wear it sometimes. What a fun one to, to throw on for an evening out, right? Anyway, thank you so much for hanging out with me for this restoration. It was really fun to uh, work on, well, the smallest swatch I've ever seen and get it back to good running and looking order at the same time. If you want to find me over on Instagram, I'm wristwatch underscore revival. If you happen to be over there, I'll post stuff um, like in between project updates or sometimes some stuff from my collection or whatever I'm up to on the bench over on Instagram. So feel free to come over there and say hi. With that, I want to thank you so much for hanging out. We'll see you next time.